I'm Robin Ranthava with Arm, and uh, thanks for having me. The title is Your Self Driving Car is Awesome, thanks to open source software like Zen. And uh, I'll try and explain what I mean over there. But uh, there we go. So Arm has a division focusing on open source software. And as it happens, it's one of the biggest divisions in Arm. That just goes to show how much emphasis Arm puts um, on open source software. Right? So the open source software group has a bunch of um, subgroups. Uh, they all kind of feed into this umbrella group, if you like, called the architecture group. I'm a part of that. I specifically own the safety track, um, whose charter is to promote the uptake of ARM IP in safety critical domains using open source software as an enabler. Uh, next, please. Oh, I can control it. Brilliant. Fine. So just driving the point home over here that um, ARM is kind of everywhere. <laughs> um, I mean, we kind of, in different capacities, know that it's used in a lot of areas, right? But if you've been following the news recently, and this, this has now gone to another level. So it's really very hard to try and come up with uh, some kind of sensible categorization. So I've chosen a few over here because I just wanted to put a vehicle autonomy, the basis for this talk, in a specific category uh, relative to the others, right? But this is not hard and fast. Um, all I'm saying is there's a deeply embedded end of the spectrum, perhaps where you don't have an MMU, perhaps you're very, very um, energy sipping and simple, like a microcontroller perhaps. And at the other end, you've got like these complex superscalar multi-issue um, designs, right? Um, we now do high performance supercomputing. We have always been on the embedded side as well, but there are many domains in between where we seem to be establishing ourselves, like the data center, et cetera. Medical autonomy seems to be on the right side of the spectrum. Okay. So what do I mean by vehicle autonomy specifically? Uh, I actually refer to this thing called the autonomous vehicle controller. Uh, it's like this block of IP that gets these data streams at a very high rate from a bunch of sensors. Uh, the more popular ones are LiDAR and camera. And at a very high level, there's a lot of detail, but at a very high level, the expectation is to do things like um, fusion, perception, planning, and control. Uh, hold on a second. Hopefully, you should see me as well now, perhaps. Yeah, anyway. It was just pointed out to me that uh, my camera was off. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, what is this? block do it runs software that kind of tries to build a, a picture of the environment of, of the vehicle and then you have a certain set of goals like trajectory planning um, um, inputs for the actuation subsystem that actually does things like velocity control gear selection brake lateral steering angle control right this is a bit that everyone in the business of doing um, well most chip makers are in this business, right? And the ecosystem around them, it, it's its the new frontier. Everyone wants to find ways to solve this. Why? Because uh, this design pattern is applicable. If you get it right, this design pattern is applicable for many, many other things other than just autonomy, right? Uh, like consumer electronics, robotics, drones, toys, take your pick. So if you can come up with a good generic design that's parameterizable, that's a valuable proposition. Um, oh, yikes. Are you still seeing the slides, right? Yes, we can see them. Okay, awesome. Here it is. Okay, cool. So what does an autonomous vehicle controller look like specifically, right? I mean, at a functional level, uh, you have a general purpose compute complex. Um, these are like, think of them like Cortex-A, well, they are Cortex-A processors, or the closest analog in a non-ARM universe would be like, you know, the processors that are in your desktop. Um, you normally have a external safety monitoring requirement, so there's some entity involved in, uh, in doing that as a part of the controller. And then you have some kind of an accelerator complex that's typically bits of IP that have been optimized to uh, offload the computations that uh, drive machine learning workloads. And so that's like uh, at a very high level, but uh, to get a better, kind of slightly more detailed view, this is what the stack typically looks like, right? So um, 
again, this is it's hard to come up with a representation that considers all the possibilities. But um, if you have cortex ray codes, you know, the expectation is that you have like secure firmware, a boot chain, something that runs a type one hypervisor. And I mean the definition of type one in a classical sense because I know it's overloaded by people. Um, and you then have like fundamentally the 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 the, the pipeline, you know, the, the pipeline that I described earlier, right, which is to do with fusion, perception, planning, control, and that's intended to be run in, in some safe composition. By safe, I mean like um, you employ techniques that you have access to in your software stack and in your hardware design to try and come up with ways of isolating these blocks and uh, ensuring that they can run without um, interference, uh, unless by design. Right. And you almost always have um, controllers, you know, containers are popular these days because of the unit level updatability and things like that that they bring. So there is an orchestration element because there is a, an external safety monitor, there is a need to interrupt with it. And there's always the need to have a story for secure over the air update at all levels. So this diagram isn't perfect, but it's kind of like just trying to get the basic ideas across. Right, so my key assertion for this audience is that you can't build this controller without using open source software. And um, just so you know, all the OEMs who are popular <laughs> are building them. And in order to formulate this assertion, I obtained empirical evidence by dialogue with almost all of them, right? So, um, but I'd like to justify that for this audience. Right, so here's the conundrum. The way it works is, uh, you have the silicon vendors uh, who supply silicon to the OEMs. Uh, the silicon vendor can also be an internal function inside an OEM. Like an OEM, original equipment manufacturer, being the car manufacturer. You have proprietary software vendors who kind of work with the OEM. The expectation the OEM has is that they want to, it's a loop of loops, really. Right? Uh, you need these autonomy algorithms, the top level things that do the fusion and the influence stuff. Um, but the hardware is also being designed in, um, in a very dynamic way. Um, so you have like a hardware design loop where you're doing the design prototype evaluation. You have the algorithms design loop where you're also doing design prototype and evaluation. You've got the foundational system software design loop. And by that, I mean everything kind of supporting those algorithms, right? So all the way down to the firmware. And then you've got the hardware characterization loop, which is uh, Basically, the bit that kind of uh, tries to bring all of this together to an extent that you can actually go back to the hardware architects and go back to the algorithm researcher, and go back to your firmware and your boot chain and your operating system and hypervisor guys and say, uh, you know, we are not really getting the determinism we need. Or actually, extrapolation using the current state of silicon tells us that there's a power envelope that we are going out of, those kind of things. Right? So, this is absolutely vital. And the reason it is so hard to do is because there are too many moving parts. People are slowly finding the feet of this, but it's taking time. So what is the real benefit of open source software? Right? And this is the bit that everyone is doing, but they don't call it out explicitly. So I had to kind of do like a meta analysis by looking at all of the OEMs and then take things up one level and say, hey, Mr. OEM A, hey, Mr. OEM B, is this what you're doing? And then they were all, oh yeah, you're right, we are doing it, but we don't really call it that way. Right? So uh, this, presentation and others I do like this are an attempt to kind of raise the level of consciousness because I think if we do raise the level of consciousness then everyone will benefit and I'll come to that later. So what happens is uh, the OEM usually has an, a baseline expectation for the kind of processors they want, the kind of clock rates, the kind of IPC they have in mind, those kind of things, the kind of memory interfaces. They have a baseline set of expectations and they get the silicon. Um, and basically, I'm using the the penguin here as just a as a kind of like a bucket for open source software. Right? But basically, open source software is used at all levels of the stack to actually verify, um, you know, the do the silicon bring up the characterization and enable the researchers to get the algorithms to run. All of that is done. The output from this is a set of acceptable software thresholds for so all of the param parameters they care about, which I mentioned previously, and also hardware thresholds. Right? Okay. Right. So. You might kill the software engineer with all, all the uh, pressure, or but he's still not able to squeeze out the clock rate or get the throughput out of the memory interface. Something needs to give. We need to change the hardware, those kind of things. So uh, the OEMs 
as it happens, provide these thresholds packaged along with um, a kind of like uh, an integration of uh, all the software that they use as a reference to the proprietary software vendors. Um, I tested whether so proprietary software vendors actually have sensitivity around taking up open source software and playing with it. And what I can say without naming names is that it's not really a problem in most cases. I'm sure there are uh, outliers, but generally it's not a problem. Right? A lot of the people who work for proprietary companies also are contributors to open source projects. Right? So they take it, um, they take the thresholds, and what they really do is They, they fundamentally replicate the elements, the open source software elements with proprietary analogs that they have a pedigree in doing certification for, right? Uh, this is a bit of pill to swallow, but the fact is it's already been done, right? And the, the path is clear and others are doing it as well. And I mean like the top three proprietary operating system shops, the software vendors, and they're all fundamentally doing this already. So what, what you have at the end of this exercise is a proprietary equivalent stack. So what happens is the proprietary vendors give this to the OEM and say, look, we're done. And either we make our expectations or we haven't, but you know what the OEM does then is they're able to allow the open source kind of, um, you know, the, the investment to pay for itself because now they can compare what the proprietary guys have done for all of the levels of the stack and for the top level um, vehicle autonomy algorithm um, use cases. And use that as a way to judge whether the output of what the proprietary guys have done is acceptable or not, right? This is hugely important and hugely valuable. So what's the upshot here, right? So the availability and quality of open source software directly impacts the quality of the proprietary vehicle autonomy control product, right? If your thresholds are not good, uh, for a myriad number of reasons, you will result in fundamentally um, kind of, you know, like uh, getting the proprietary software vendor to produce a poorer offering, right? You're inadvertently encouraging that. So the, we must never uh, focus away from the, the important problem of finding ways to land open source software in proprietary products. That's, that needs to be solved. It's a hard problem. Personally, um, I'm personally involved in initiatives like ELISA and others, and we try and find ways and kind of like pushing the envelope over here, you know, as Linux goes, right? And we know that there are some of our friends in the automotive ecosystem who actually come up with novel ways to try and put constraints on Linux to an extent where it can perhaps be used in certain classes of safety applications. But it's a hard problem. It needs to be solved. My point is that we must not lose sight of the fact that open source software has already been adding value, despite being hard to certify. Okay. So we, we can't, uh, we, we should leverage this knowledge. Right? So a key ask from all the OEMs that I interact with is access to good quality software integrations. Right? So they want the tool chains, right? So they're like your ARM, we're going to be using your ARM IP in some form or the other, it's inevitable. So, um, can you help us get the tools with the, with the right support for the relevant architecture revision and process implementation teams? Um, secure firmware, your RAM, you produce open source secure firmware. Can we get it from you? And can we get it in a way that's ready or easy to integrate with our product? Standards compliant boot chains, ARM is invested heavily in coming up with interfaces for not just the firmware or the exception levels that we have in the process, but also um, also, um, interfaces for bootloaders, interfaces for operating systems, right? So we've worked very hard with open source communities to produce, um, to get the popular projects to use these. Right? But the partners are like, can we have all of that in a nice integrated way, please? Because then we know it's from on and we can get to school quicker rather than doing it over again. Right? So, and hypervisors, right? So the use cases they have range from both ends of the spectrum, right? So it's like either they, they have static partitioning ones or dynamic resource sharing ones, they want everything. Um, and of course, re representative implementation of the top level um, autonomy algorithms. Can you give us an application that shows us how to use some canned data and do point cloud generation, uh, object detection, those kind of things. So where does Zen come into all of this? Uh, well, the safety critical machines uh, subteam inside um, 
the open source software group uh, produces uh, a reference stack. Um, and Zen is a very central part of that stack, uh, simply because it kind of ticks some interesting boxes, right? So one is the community vibrancy. The other one is um, the ability to scale across that spectrum I mentioned of you know, static kind of configurations as well as more dynamic ones. And um, we found that the quality of the ARM uh, port is good. There, we have views on how to improve that. Um, we are on a journey here where we are trying to make sure that um, our investment in Zen incrementally improves. And, and the SCM team's reference stack is one way of enabling that. So, there are some uncharted territories. Um, my information here is not complete, but I have colleagues like Bertrand Maki, who's also going to be presenting after me as it happens, and um, Philippe Renanti and others inside ARM, um, kind of, some of whom I'm sure you know. Um, we're trying to kind of like uh, build a better understanding of what are some of the gaps that are likely to become important uh, as we move along. Right? So heterogeneous systems, the design pattern of using uniform ISA, but uh, heterogeneous power proof, right? big little designs as they're called, uh, that, that pattern is set across the partnership and multiple target domains. So we need better support for that. As chiplets and coherent multi-node interconnects become more and more prevalent, especially in the vehicle autonomy space, they already are, you need, uh, there will be a demand in, in the face of fault pressure to actually migrate context very rapidly across nodes. Right? Now, we believe that the, the fundamentals for pulling this off already exist, but we, we want to try and make sure that it's, it's the best quality. And then there's the whole power performance and, you know, like the thermal reality story, which is, um, which is always a tricky one. And, uh, I have a mobile um, background and I'm aware of some of this. So uh, we want to try and see what is the right strategy to evolve over here. Right? And we're not convinced that um, there is a reasonably kind of uniform strategy that can be applied to a lot of the use cases that we have in mind. And uh, the, the so-called true DOM zero list operation is Stefano has been kind of sharing information with us. It's really exciting. It opens up the possibility of uh, doing the static partitioning scheme. Uh, it opens up the possibility of perhaps um, offloading this important uh, aspect of system initialization and runtime control to an external agent like the safety monitor I mentioned previously. So that's all I had. It was 25 minutes and I was already late, so I've kind of zipped through this. But what I would really appreciate is um, if you have any questions or if you would like to know more, please get in touch. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say for the moment. I think I'm kind of within the time limit still. George, others? Yeah, I think that sounds good to me. Do I sound better now, by the way? Uh, um, unfortunately, you're still a robot. No. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I have a bit of an anecdote there to share very quickly. I mean, uh, we have like uh, bi weekly, I mean, every two week calls with Stefano, and he often sounds just like you. So perhaps you guys are using a similar configuration of some sort. I don't know. Worth checking. <laughs> Anyway, I'm open for questions, uh, either here or on the, the chat thing or, or anywhere else, really, just let me know.
Romina, I think you have some question in the chat that you can look at on related to Nova. Just a second, I'm kind of, I know the sounds weird, but um, I'm actually trying to find the chat. Ah, oh, I see it now. Um, you're welcome. Um, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, you're welcome, Christopher Clark. Um, yes, I should point out that Bertrand is going to be kind of like uh, providing some additional insights. Uh, yes, Updating is promising. Uh, it's one of the things that has come up in the context of secure multi level update. Um, inevitably, every time you mention something like Updating, people also have alternates. So we haven't really solidified our story in terms of what we want to do, but we will. Um, Ryan, uh, I hope I pronounced that right. You're saying when you say DOM0 less, are you referencing to an architecture like Nova? I must confess, Nova sounds familiar, <laughs> but uh, I'm not sure. Maybe I can, I'll try and drop a link over here to a really good presentation from um, from Stefano on, on, on specifically DOM0 less. Actually, my understanding is, and Bertrand can connect, correct me over here, but I think it's, um, I, you don't I, have will, it yeah. I will speak of this subject in my in my presentation just after and I'm explaining this, this architecture actually in one slide. Perfect. Dom zero uh, less. So Ryan, please attend that, uh, <laughs> that, uh, that session. You're welcome, man. And hi, Julian. <laughs> You're welcome, Daniel. Okay. You're welcome, Deb. Thanks for your support. And sorry for the, the confusion at the start. <laughs> um, I hope to get in touch with some of you guys in the future. Uh, I'll sign off now, then. Right, I'm off. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.